What is HPV? And should you be stressed if you have it? Let's talk about that today. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Dr. Jennifer Lincoln, board certified OBGYN, author, social media educator. And today I'm talking about HPV because I am getting a lot of questions about this. Before I get started, go ahead and subscribe. If you're not already subscribed and turn on the notifications so you never miss an update. All right, HPV stands for human papillomavirus. There are over 150 types of HPV. Don't worry, we're not talking about all of them today. And we're talking about it because it's super common. There's a lot of misinformation. And so we're gonna set the record straight. So first things first, is HPV common? And the answer is yes. I call it the common cold of the vagina because up to 80% of people at some point in time will have HPV if they're sexually active. So yes, super common. You are not alone if you've been diagnosed with it. Just to help you realize how not alone you are, 79 million people in the US have been diagnosed with it. And every year there are about 14 million new cases. Woo! Oftentimes there are no symptoms. The strains that cause genital warts, that could be a symptom, but even if you're carrying it, you might not always have outbreaks so that you even know that you have it. And in 2018, HPV and the treatment and the diagnosis related to it cost the United States $775 million in direct medical costs. That's insane. So how do you get HPV through sexual activity? Whether it's vagina and penis sex, anal sex, oral sex, all of those ways are able to spread HPV. The HPV virus can live and grow in the vagina, the penis, the anus, and the throat. So it can cause problems in those areas. So what's so bad about it? Well, two things. The first are genital warts, which are not life-threatening, but aren't super fun. The one that's more concerning and that people often ask me about are the HPV strains that are associated with cancer. We most commonly hear this associated with cervical cancer, but it can also cause cancer of the vagina, cancer of the vulva, cancer of the penis, anus, and the mouth and the throat. And so this doesn't just affect women, it affects all genders. And we're actually seeing that HPV associated cancer of the throat is increasing in men in the United States. And when it comes to cervical cancer, there are about 13,000 new diagnoses every year in the United States and people who have a cervix. Let's talk about how you get tested. So there are two ways to do this when it comes to checking for the HPV that's associated with cervical cancer. The first is during a pap test, your provider can collect the kind of pap that not only the pathologist can look at the cells of the cervix under the microscope to see if there's any abnormal changes in the cells, but they can also send that sample to check for high risk strains of HPV. You can also separately do an HPV swab during a speculum exam while you're not doing a pap smear. It's recommended that HPV screening start at age 30. And you might wonder, Dr. Jen, why are we not screening and you know, everybody who's sexually active from the moment they get started since you're telling me that 80% of people will get HPV. And the bottom line is that for a lot of people, HPV actually regresses and causes no problems, especially the younger you are. So from a risk benefit standpoint, it actually makes sense to wait to screen for HPV along with a pap smear starting at the age of 30. It is also acceptable to start doing HPV screening at the age of 25 without doing a pap smear. But right now, our best recommendation is to start your pap smear screening starting at age 21 every three years, and then starting at age 30 to do PAPS plus HPV screening. So a negative HPV test means that you don't have the high risk strains that are linked with cancer. And again, we're not testing for all strains of HPV, just the ones that lead to cancer, because those are the ones that we care about. And if you're wondering what does a PAP smear have to do with cervical cancer and HPV, HPV causes changes in cervical cells that can be precancerous and then eventually become cancerous. And that's what we're looking for on a pap test are any of these changes that if left alone could become cervical cancer, that way we can intervene ahead of time because thankfully cervical cancer is extremely slow growing and it's a very long time from onset of abnormalities to progression of cancer. So we have a lot of time in between to intervene. Let's talk about, okay, I've got HPV, now what? The first thing is to breathe. I've had a lot of people who've messaged me really freaking out, thinking that it's as bad as other infections like HIV or other really concerning things, and it's, it's not. First of all, remember, you're in good company. The second thing to remember is that about 90% of these will regress on their own. How do you increase the chance that it will regress or your body will be able to clear the virus? The number one thing you can do is if you're smoking, to stop smoking. Smoking really screws up your immune system and we've seen much higher rates of cervical cancer in smokers. So if you are a smoker, here's another great reason to quit. If you're not a smoker, other ways to you know optimize your immune system, I say it in quotes because lots of people use that term to like sell you a supplement and they're bogus. 
It's really leading a healthy lifestyle. Eat as good as you can, exercise, those are really good things. Unfortunately, if you've been diagnosed with HPV, there's no way to predict if it will regress for you or not. So that's why increased surveillance is important. So if you get an HPV positive test result, there's some other things we need to do. If you've had a pap smear that shows some abnormalities, we need to get more information. And usually this is in the form of doing something called a colposcopy, where we basically are able to get a better look at the cervix. We put something called acetic acid, which is, yes, it's just vinegar, and we put it on the cervix and we use a little microscope to be able to better see the cervix and abnormal cells will light up in a different way and we're able to get a tiny biopsy and send that off to the pathologist so they can really get a better understanding of just how abnormal your cervical cells are. If they're high-grade abnormalities, we may recommend removing that little part of the cervix called a LEAP procedure. And I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail here, Maybe that's something we'll talk about at another day. Now, when it comes to treatment for genital warts, there are treatments. You can freeze them off, you can use laser, you can excise them or remove them, or you can put topical medicine on. So there are some treatments available for that. Let's talk prevention, because if you don't have HPV and you're just here because you wanna know how do I not get it, or even if you've had a strain of HPV and you wanna know how not to get exposed to the other strains, let's talk about that. And the number one way to prevent it is actually vaccination. The HPV vaccines that are on the market right now are 99% effective at preventing getting HPV. That is amazing. This vaccine is recommended to be given at age 11 or 12 for both girls and boys. Yes, when it first came out, they were just talking about giving it to girls, which is so stupid because how do you think it spreads? Anyway, so everybody should get it. And it is now FDA approved up until the age of 45. Doesn't mean you can't get it past that, just talk with your provider, but we know that the earlier you get it, getting it before you're exposed to HPV, the better protected you are. It can be given to kids as young as nine. And if you've been exposed to one kind of HPV, you can still get the vaccine because it could protect you from other strains of HPV. So go ahead and talk with your healthcare provider if you have questions about that. There is a ton of misinformation about the HPV vaccine on the internet. And why do we think this is? Because people think, oh my God, HPV, HPV, and you're gonna give preteens this vaccine and they're gonna think it's okay to have sex and this country is just obsessed with anything that might have to do with sex. So there's just a ton of garbage out there. It is a ridiculously well-studied vaccine. Over 270 million doses of this vaccine have been given out worldwide and there have been no safety signals or severe adverse reactions recorded in the vaccine reporting system and other follow-up studies. And I will put those references and resources in the show notes because I think it's important to get this information from reliable sources. If you're a parent and you're watching this and you think that giving this vaccine means your kids now think it's okay to have sex, they've studied this and it does not increase the rate of sexual activity or lower the rate of, of kids having sex because they now have this vaccine. Like they, they are not thinking that way. Okay, let's wrap this up. HPV, super common, associated with warts and cancers of the cervix, the throat, the anus. So this doesn't just affect people with the uterus, it affects everybody. The best way to prevent it is to get the vaccine. Other ways to prevent it too are safe sex practices. So that means condoms. And when it comes to oral sex, things like dental dams and getting tested. The other thing that you can do is stay on top of your cervical cancer screening through pap smears and HPV testing. And know that if you do have it, very often it will regress, but that doesn't mean you should blow it off. And there are some things you can do like stop smoking to increase the chance that it'll go away for you. What other questions do you have about HPV? Go ahead and drop them in the comment section. I will have lots of references and resources for you in the show notes. And as always, if you like this content, go ahead and follow me at Dr. Jennifer Lincoln on TikTok and Instagram for more. All right, friends, I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.